afternoon. You're tuned into the Labor Forum here at WRFG 89.3 FM. My name is Diane Mathewitz. I'm a retired auto worker, co-host of this program, along with Paul McLennan, member of ATU Local 732. Hi, Paul. Hi, Diane. Uh, so this is the last Monday that the Labor Forum will have the opportunity to ask you, our listeners, for support, financial support during our pledge drive. I just want to remind you that we have one more week, but actually, in truth, you have 365 days a year to contribute to WRFG. Uh, and we do want to make sure that you're aware that uh, your contributions are the main financial support for this station, and we very sincerely appreciate uh, any amount of money that you're able to give. I'll be giving some more information about how you can donate in a moment. Uh, this um, program is part of the mission of WRFG, but I want to make sure you're aware that the opinions that are expressed on it may not necessarily be those of the Board of Directors, staff, or volunteers here at WRFG. We're going to go right ahead with our labor headlines and this week in labor history because we have really terrific guests sitting here in the studio and are going to be calling in from Virginia, and we want to make sure we give them max time. So, here we go. Labor headlines for Monday, April 18th, 2016. Maybe this segment today should be called Missing Headlines. One of the many benefits of listening to WRFG and the Labor Forum in particular is that you hear about meaningful issues and actions being taken by working class people to win justice and civil and human rights for all. This past Saturday, tens of thousands rallied in London against the disastrous social service cuts being advanced by the conservative government of Prime Minister David Cameron, who, by the way, is mentioned in the Panama Papers. Marching behind a banner that read, quote, we demand health, homes, jobs, and education, Cameron must go, the massive crowd of trade unionists, students, unemployed and retired folks carried signs reflecting the broad range of social issues from no to war, racism, and Islamophobia, to specific demands to build housing, save the national health care plan, protect jobs, and fully fund education. The week before, many thousands of London's diverse Muslim community held a march against ISIS to make clear that Islam does not condone terrorism. There are about 1.5 billion Muslims worldwide, accounting for about 22% of the global population. Organizers of the event noted with dismay the failure of the capitalist media to mention the anti-ISIS protest on their newscasts. ISIS has killed thousands of Muslims and forced the displacement of huge numbers of families in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Syria, and other countries destabilized by U.S. and NATO military intervention. Terrorist attacks on mosques, schools, marketplaces, beach resorts, bus stations, and other civilian gathering places occur with horrifying regularity in countries as varied as Nigeria and Somalia to Turkey and India. Yet, the mass media devotes around-the-clock coverage to only those attacks in western cities like Paris and Brussels, which the march organizers say promotes Islamophobia and increased repression not just against Muslims, but all foreign-born immigrants and people of color in general. Now here's an example of the same one-sided media coverage failing to report on a progressive mobilization in the U.S. Starting Monday, April 11th, a broad coalition of organizations and individuals began a 140-mile march from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. to bring attention to the role of big money in the electoral process in the U.S. Called Democracy Spring, it conducted a series of protests and sit-ins in front of Congress all last week that resulted in hundreds of arrests. The largely youthful crowd of thousands demanded Congress act to counter the effects of the Citizens United Supreme Court decision that has allowed unfettered spending by corporations and individuals, such as the arch right-wing Koch brothers, to control the election process. 
An overlapping coalition called Democracy Awakening is keeping up the pressure with rallies and marches that began on Saturday, April 16th, and continue through today. With a similar demand about the corrupting influence of unlimited corporate money on the U.S. electoral process, this coalition is demanding specific remedies to the Voting Rights Act and action on the Supreme Court nominee advanced by President Obama. So lots of pundits explain Donald Trump and Ted Cruz's election success to the dissatisfaction of people that they are not being heard, that the system is not working for them. But Trump and Cruz turn that anger to others like immigrants, LGBTQ folks, the poor, and, um, and many other groups whose rights are even more denied. Who benefits from this lack of unity and solidarity? The very profit system, the corporate and political managerial class. So I only knew about all these self-organized yet mass at actions because of the internet and because I look for what and how the people are fighting and resisting their exploitation and oppression. Tonight I expect the local news channels will devote time to this racist, anti-Islam, anti-immigrant, gun-toting, right-winger, and Trump supporter who declared he was going to shred a copy of a major religion's holy book, the Quran, at the state capitol and in front of CNN. Happening at literally the exact same time, the residents of Peoplestown were delivering thousands of petition signatures at City Hall, calling for genuine recognition and participation of the residents of the neighborhoods of Turner Field in the upcoming redevelopment plans. The news directors of the media had a choice. Send your crew to a multinational, intergenerational community effort to voice real concerns and offer real solutions versus film a loudmouth, backward, violent talking, divisive lout who only seeks to poison our community with hate. Every station's truck was parked along Washington Street. Go one way to the city hall entrance, the other to the state capitol steps. Can you guess which way they all went? And that is the best reason I can give why you should contribute to WRFG 89.3 FM so that we can strengthen our public affairs programming that examines the issues affecting you and your community, but also lets you share in the cultural and music expressions that nourish and enlarge our spirits. You can go online at www.wrfg anytime, just like you can call into the station at 404-523-8989, day or night, to make your pledge. And our brothers and sisters at the post office will be glad to process and deliver your letter with your check sent to 1083 Austin Avenue Northeast, and they'll do it in all kinds of weather and with a smile. And that's our headline, actually missing headline news for today. We'll go right to Paul and this week in labor history. Thanks, Diane. There is an important date this week in the history of the black freedom movement in this country. On April 17, 1960, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, was formed at a conference of 300 youth and students at Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina. A wave of student sit-ins had begun in Greensboro and Nashville earlier that year and spread across the South. The conference was convened to talk about coordinating these protests, and this led to the forming of a new organization. Ella Baker was instrumental in organizing the conference. She saw the potential for a special type of leadership youth could provide that would revitalize the black freedom movement and take it in a new direction. Baker wanted to bring the sit-in participants together in a way that would sustain the momentum of their actions teach them the necessary skills, provide the resources that were needed, and help them to coalesce into a more militant and radically democratic force. Under Ella Baker's radical black feminist influence, SNCC embodied a race, class, and gender analysis and vision. Her view was that organizational power should be horizontal and radically democratic. Not using the master's tools made it possible for SNCC to be on the cutting edge of radical change 
and a driving force within the overall movement. The work of SNCC opened the door to the many other social movements that followed, including the anti-Vietnam War and women's movements. Ella Baker's life demonstrated the power that arises from standing at the intersection of multiple oppressions and promoting the development of indigenous local leadership. SNCC's emergence as a force in the Southern Civil Rights Movement came largely through the involvement of students in the 1961 Freedom Rides, designed to test a 1960 Supreme Court ruling that declared segregation in interstate travel facilities unconstitutional. In 1964, they organized Freedom Summer, a massive Mississippi voter registration campaign which included the establishing of more than 40 freedom schools, which used popular education methods to combine politics with skill development in order to develop new leaders. Freedom Summer led to the organizing of an independent political party, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. This new party sent representatives to the Democratic Party convention in Atlantic City in 1964, demanding that their delegates be seated. When Fannie Lou Hamer, a leader of the party, was in the midst of testifying about the police beatings of her and others for attempting to exercise their right to vote, President Lyndon Johnson preempted television co coverage of the credentials hearing fight to hold a press conference. When the Democratic Party offered a so-called compromise of two non-voting seats, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party rejected both the compromise and the pressure to accept it and walked out. The young SNCC organizers did not follow any charismatic national leader. Far from being a complete break with the past, their work was based directly on the work of an older generation of activists, people like Ella Baker, Septima Clark, Amzie Moore, and Medgar Evers. While historians have commonly portrayed the movement leadership as well-educated male church leaders, historians like Charles Payne write that organizers in the most dangerous parts of the South look for leadership to working-class rural African Americans and especially to women like Fannie Lou Hamer. SNCC field organizers spread across the South into the heart of apartheid segregation, seeking to both develop and reinforce local leadership. The leaders were ordinary women and men, sharecroppers, domestics, high school students, beauticians, independent farmers, committed to organizing the freedom struggle house by house, block by block, relationship by relationship. SNCC's un unique bottom-up approach to organizing led to the emergence of powerful grassroots organizations and their uncompromising style of nonviolent direct action confronted racial injustice throughout the South and changed politics in this country forever. SNCC combined their focus on local organizing with a human rights worldview and saw the struggle for freedom here as an integral part of the worldwide movement of all oppressed people. In January 1966, SNCC issued a public statement declaring opposition to the military draft and the Vietnam War. In April 1967, SNCC leader Kwame Ture declared that the draft was nothing more than white people sending black people to make war on yellow people in order to defend the land they stole from red people. SNCC also took a position in support of Egypt and other Arab states as well as the rights of the Palestinian people under Israeli occupation. Whether it was direct action against racial injustice, starting a freedom school or an agricultural cooperative, building an independent political party, or taking a stand against U.S. imperialism, SNCC's body of work is full of rich lessons for us today. Thank you so much, Paul. And we're going to move right to a message so important from WRFG for our listeners, and then we're going to have a conversation with our guest in the studio, Yolan Tomlinson. Stay tuned. Well, actually, we're about to talk with the person who just uh, recorded that announcement for WRFG. So in the studio, we have Yolan Tomlinson. Hi. Hello, Diane. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so, not by coincidence, uh, <laughs> Yolan recorded that. Um, 
she is the co-founder and director of education and applied intersectionality with a new organization in town, the Organization for Human Rights and Democracy. So uh, welcome, Yolande. Thanks, Paul. Great to be here. <laughs> So um, could you say a little about yourself and why uh, this event is happening? Thank you both Paul and Diane for being here um, and for talking about this event. Um, as you've introduced me, I'm Dr. Yolan Tomlinson. I uh, have a background in academia, specifically hold a PhD in American Studies with a strong emphasis on a rad radical black feminist uh, analysis and praxis. Um, and OHRD is a grassroots movement-based organization that conducts its work at the intersection of a radical queer feminist politics um, and human rights. And so the way to think about that is that intersectionality, the framework that talks about uh, radical black feminist queer politics, is about um, confronting power at its source, whereas human rights um, uh, forces us to talk about a wide breadth of issues. And so bringing those together, um, our organization seeks to have a local focus where we model transformative change while having a broad global perspective and analysis on the work that we do. So could you say a little more about the event and what the purpose of that is? Yes, absolutely. So this event is called Displaced Palestinian Exiles uh, Speak to Atlanta. Um, and it is um, an event that brings refugees, uh, Palestinian refugees who were exiled um, in 1947, 1948 specifically for this particular speaker, um, to, uh, they're on a national, international tour actually across North America to raise a profile around refugees currently in exile. Um, and this particular group of um, speakers are from Lebanon. Uh, they for the past 68 years, have been living in makeshift camps under horrid conditions, um, you know, kind of their life at stake. Um, and this event is meant to raise the profile both of uh, the Nakba, which in Arabic means or translates to catastrophe, um, broaden the conversation around the Palestinian-Israeli conflict to move beyond um, the post-1967 uh, occupation. Um, it's also another way for us to enter uh, this conversation. I think so often people think about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and it feels so overwhelming, kind of like, oh, I can't wrap my head around that, it's too big, I don't know where to start. Well, this is, a, I think, a, a really important event for both broadening our understanding of it as well as offering us an inroad into it, into understanding it. Uh, so, for example, I think oftentimes people are um, concerned about, well, what does it mean to be anti-Zionist versus anti-Semitic? Um, and so we have the conversation stall there. This event in particular, um, the issues around it, around the um, expulsion and massacre and the clearing of the land and, and the killing of the people, the Palestinian people, for the resurrection of, the, um, the Isra of Israel, um, the, the Jewish homeland, if you will, um, raises the issue in a, in a way that you don't often have the conversation around power, around violence, state violence in particular, about genocide, um, apartheid, and refugees still at, at, in struggle. Um, and so I think, it's an, I think it's an easy concept for us to grasp, especially as folks who um, in Atlanta are facing some of the similar challenges um, in a local context, um, both in terms of a national context as well, around uh, U.S. Um, imperial violence across the world. Um, and so I think it's an important uh, conversation to be had and an opportunity for local activists, students, um, and Atlantans in general to come out and hear our speakers and have a conversation about how the things that we're experiencing here connects within the global framework. Yeah, so when, when I did my missing headlines, I was talking about you know, these thousands of petitions that people in People's Town, residents of People's Town, and this is a, a, an attempt by a neighborhood that has been multiple times um, through uh, urban renewal, the development of two stadiums, uh, had, an interstate, and an interstate, um, had their whole neighborhoods, their lives, uh, their community turned upside down, and essentially displaced, and uh, oftentimes having to leave everything that's familiar, move sometimes to even a suburb, or even move further. So I, I, I would hope that the, that the program does a little bit figure out how we can see the forces that are behind uh, the uh, unwanted moving that happens not just to people in People's Town, not just to people in Palestine, but literally 
tens and tens and tens of thousands from war stricken areas, from places with drought, I mean all of the conditions that are forcing people to leave their homes. So is that part of the intent of this program? Absolutely, Diane. Um, and what you pointed to by you know raising that particular incident is to talk about really some of the tactics of domination and power, right? So we have this broad global framework around the removal, massacring, and continued um, you know, genocide around the Palestinian people. Um, we have local examples of how that tactic looks. Um, and so when we're talking about um, the dismantling of the public sector, um, issues around displacement and gentrification, we're talking about similar tactics at work. Uh, we're talking about um, clearing the land, the space for development, for new housing, for people who have access and resources to take over that space. And we see patterns like this across the country and in Atlanta, um, not just in terms of housing, but in terms of transportation. Uh, what's happening uh, with MARTA, um, recent privatization of um, you know, disability, was it disability services? services? Absolutely. Um, and then we're also talking about this as it looks in terms of privatization of public resources in general, uh, Grady. So if you think about the services, the, the resources, the community, the structure that people who are often and are historically disadvantaged um, that we're going through in Atlanta, we see that there is an, I would call it a form of um, uh, urban cleansing, uh, ethnic cleansing that's happening. Um, and it happens through the public sector and it's happening across Atlanta. Um, and people don't often know how to make those connections to um, understand the issue in a holistic, broader framework. Um, and so for folks who are working on issues of transportation, housing, um, you know, health, uh, health care, I would say this is an opportunity to connect with folks, to connect on issues, um, people who are working on um, immigration and refugee rights to also come out and understand that this is there are local examples, national examples that you've um, talked I've talked about, as well as a global framework for understanding this. And these are strategic um, things that are happening. And if we don't become more um, connected and strategic ourselves, then we risk, um, our, you know, our livelihood and our existence, our community, our culture in the process. Um, the two speakers that are coming from Lebanon are both women, and I'm wondering if you could say a little about the relationship between gender and state violence? Uh, yes. Um, so it's not often that we are privileged to have, you know, a slate of speakers that are, are women, especially in the, in the context of um, international relations and, and global issues. Um, so one, it's a, it's a pleasure to have that we're talking about an intergenerational conversation as well. Um, Mariam Fatala, the, the 86-year-old speaker, she was um, an original um, you know, survivor of the NAFWA, uh, as well as Amina Ashkar, who, um, you know, is a young woman who's a, a, a great-granddaughter of other survivors as well. Um, and so both of them are, you know, speaking from their own lived experiences, as well as, you know, speaking about, um, you know, the community's experience living in Lebanon and the statelessness. Um, I think sometimes, and I think uh, the feminist movement, uh, women and gender issues as well, when we talk about it or think about, well, you know, women's rights are being violated in Palestine and so it's the global south and these third world countries and so forth. Um, and what this intersectional framework, what um, a radical black feminist politics says is that we can't talk about issues of gender without talking about nation formation, without talking about race class and all of these issues. And what this does is raise the profile as well. We can't talk about Palestinian women's liberation without talking about the liberation of the entire Palestinian people. So I think that they themselves um, speak to this. Um, Palestinian uh, feminists have also spoken. We don't need you to fight our struggles. We need you to um, open up the framework in your own local context for us to speak for ourselves and to raise the issue in a broader framework um, and to talk about the whole Palestinian um, um, movement and issues at stake. So we only have like another minute or so. Could you repeat all the factual information, time, place? So the event will be uh, at 6.30 p.m. start um, at the Absalon Jones Episcopal Center. Uh, it's at 807 uh, Student Movement Boulevard, formerly Fair Street, uh, area code 30, zip code 30314. Uh, we will have free food and drinks Thursday uh, the 21st. Uh, child care will be provided, all OHRD events, that's a standard. Uh, free admission, uh, we ask for a small $5 donation, uh, but no one will be turned away for any of that. Um, and again, uh, this is an opportunity to make uh, local connections within a broader global framework. 
So thank you so much, very much. And uh, we'll be there, right? Paul and I will be there. Uh, everybody else will be there too, I guess, who's here in the studio. Um, and we want to thank you for coming in today. Thank you, Diane and Paul. All right, so we have another great message from WRFG, and then we have Eric Richardson in the studio and two sisters with the Communication Workers of America who are on strike with Verizon calling us from southwestern Virginia. Stay tuned.